Join over 5,000 attendees for the largest AI event in Asia at Super AI Singapore, June 5th and 6th, 2024. Raul Pal, Benedict Evans, Balaji Srinivasan, Edward Snowden, and over 150 others will join the industry's most influential to explore and unveil the next wave of transformative AI technologies. Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a week from June 3rd through June 9th with over 150 side events that will make for unparalleled networking opportunities. Visit www.realvision.com forward slash super AI for 20% off tickets with the code REALVISION or click below. Hi, I'm Ralph Hal, and welcome to my show, The Journeyman. And as you know by now, I'm going on a journey to the nexus of where macro meets crypto and the exponential age. You see, I do think that this is one of the most exciting times to be alive. And the change that we're going through is so dramatic that it's out with the old system, in with the new system. And we kind of get a front row seat. I'm super lucky in where I sit that I get to talk to just the most incredible people in the world. And I'm truly blessed. The kinds of conversation of access to people I have is just, I never thought I'd have this in my life. You know, I came up, yes, I had amazing opportunities in the hedge fund world where I got to speak to many of the greatest hedge fund managers on a daily basis. But now I kind of get to speak to anybody I want to about whatever I want to. And that's a super privilege. And you get to look over my shoulder and join me in those conversations. Today, we're going to talk about NFTs. And NFTs are an incredibly important technology. And really what it is, is if you think of all of humanity, everything we do is a contract. We all sign contracts, whether it's your credit card or whether it's um, a ticket or whether it's agreeing to meet a friend for a drink that evening. Everything is a contract. All humanity organizes itself with contracts. Now, some are so important that you need notaries and lawyers. Others are not important. You just need an email confirmation or a WhatsApp message or an SMS. But all of these contractual things exist. And as we get into a digital world, these contracts start existing in, on a blockchain, particularly the ones that have value. And this is all part of this value layer that blockchain technology enables for the internet. You see, in a digital world, everything digital goes to zero in value over time because you can basically make infinite amounts of anything. And we've seen that from everything from cloud to compute to email. It all goes to zero cost. And it will happen relentlessly. It's going to happen with AI too. It'll go to basically zero cost. So in an increasingly digital world, how do you create value? And that was a problem that was not solvable very easily. Firstly, there was the scarcity value of Bitcoin. That was one thing. But Bitcoin was just Bitcoin itself. But what about all the rest of humanity's contracts? What about the value? What about stuff, digital assets that are becoming more um, predominant? And then the NFT came out and the NFT was our way of recording these contracts on the blockchain. My view is, well, the first thing that should have happened with NFTs is like OTC derivative markets and finance stuff. But no, the finance market is slow to adapt. In fact, most people were slow to understand what this technology actually was. But there's a group of people who've always embraced technology earlier than anybody else. And that's the artists. You see, art is at the epicenter of culture and change. They're kind of the commentators and the curators of what is happening at a moment in time. And what we found was it solved a huge problem really quickly for a massive part of the art market that had developed, which was digital art. You see, digital artists were appearing on places like DeviantArt, but there was no way to sell a JPEG because you can make infinite JPEGs. So how do you create scarcity in a digital world? And that problem plagued all of these artists, even though the medium had become very big. Same with film, same with a lot of stuff photography and suddenly they started to figure out that nfts were the answer and you could you could have unique assets or a numbered like a limited edition print 
and be recorded on the blockchain and be transferred on the blockchain. So there was ownership plus value. Okay, that was super interesting. Artists were first and they took it and ran with it. They then integrated AI by creating generative art, which is AI generated art prompted by humans. Whole new art, type of art. And they're always pioneers in pretty much everything going on. Music, arts, you know, graphical arts, other arts. They're always at the forefront because they are experimenters by nature. Now, I'm really, really excited for this next conversation because we only met recently. Well, actually, we met a while ago um, in some fancy event in Utah. Um, but it, that was a slightly crazy event. And I really got to know people, Mike Winkleman, at uh, his studio recently, where I was lucky enough invited to a very small round table of the world's greatest NFT artists, collectors, museums, uh, everybody else um, involved in the space, traditional art, everybody. And I got on really well with Mike. Super interesting guy. A lot of fun. Now, I'm going to give you a caveat. He swears more than me. This, I think, has the highest swear count of any video in the history of Real Vision. And there's a lot in the conversation. It's a lot of fun. So please enjoy. And some of the graphic images, if you know Beeple, they're going to upset you. And that's the whole point. Enjoy. Join me, Raoul Pal, as I go on a journey of discovery through the macro, crypto, and exponential age landscapes. In The Journeyman, I talk to the smartest people in the world so we can all become smarter together. Mike, welcome to Real Vision. I'm really looking forward to this. But before we kick off, I want to ask a question that I'm not I'm not sure I've asked anybody before, but I thought I wanted to ask you. Okay. What is the obsession with Cox? <laughs> you sure you've never asked anybody else that before? It's very, <laughs> Maybe no, I it's have. Very funny. This is actually pretty recent. And I was actually going to go through and see how many of my pictures just in the last, like, say 90 days or even that i feel like everybody else is obsessed with penises and they're trying to project that onto me but it's it's funny though because like prior to this like if you went back a bit there was kind of a phase where there was a lot of like milking there was a lot of like people like buzz light in your head was being melted and like all this like there was a, a milking phase that I went through before, so this is just a phase. It'll pass. Everybody else is a lot more. Uh, I think I'm so. There was. It was definitely like there was a three week window that everything was a penis, which you know. There was, I, I will say it's been a more prevalent theme uh, lately. I will, <laughs> and even last night I had an idea. I was like, no, that's probably too much. Everybody's just going to say that's enough. I, I don't believe you have that line. The it's too much. I remember I was when I, I really started seeing your work was when we were at that event together in Utah, this very fancy event, you're on stage talking and there's a picture of a gigantic, I think Mark Zuckerberg's <laughs> balls behind you. And I'm like, this is not for real. Even you can keep a straight face. No, I remember that. It was a picture of me, like, with, like, balls or something, like, like weightlifting something. That's right. And I specifically, the, remember, the reason I remember that is I was looking through the slideshow they had put together beforehand, and I specifically was like, ah, can you take that one out? Because if I see that one, I'm going to start laughing. And they're like, yo, yeah, no problem. And then they didn't. And it was just like, God damn it. I see it come up. And it's like super jarring. And like, it's just like, okay, what the fuck? Like, come on. But no, that's funny you say, like, I don't think you have a line. That's not true at all. I absolutely have many things where I'm like, that's probably too much. So if you can believe that the things you see are a filtered version of my mind, that that is actually the truth. There's, well, that's there's... how I think of your art. I'm going to get into the whole story of this, but this is how I think of your art: is that it's the it's the part of your mind that normally people don't show, 
and you show it every day and it's it's hilarious and you know i just even the just twitter interactions i mean you just post anything and you get several thousand likes just because it, it's just it's very different and it's just a little part of your slightly troublesome mind that's true but i think what i what it actually is and this is something that i think makes it sort of different and new and a sign of of when we live is to me it is sort of like an embodiment of the internet and the internet the culture of the internet is actually super immature like literally just two days ago Elon, the richest person, most successful, you know, person in the world, posted a, like, boob joke. The person who owns this platform and is trying to, like, <laughs> entice advertisers to spend millions of dollars of advertising money, posted some, like, boob meme joke. And it's just like, okay, I guess that's... Like, it's just, you look at the, like, Joe Biden just posted this, like, dark Brandon thing. Like, that's the president of the United States. <laughs> posted some, like, this joke about how people, like, you know, were, were chanting, fuck Joe Biden. Like, and that that's, again... But why is the internet, why are humans like that on the internet? You wouldn't, you know, you might walk out the around Charleston chatting to people and you wouldn't be that and, and I don't know what there's a level of abstraction from real life that makes you say and do things you normally wouldn't do and I think it makes you less mature it makes you less mature in that you would get into fights with people you normally wouldn't get into and just be like okay I'm not going to argue with this fucking random stranger over there you know what i mean it makes you say things that you normally wouldn't say and so to me i'm trying to sort of like capture some of that some of this moment and that immaturity that exists in art because again that's that's not what art's supposed to be if you think historically it's supposed to be this very serious thing and this very you know principled thing but to me, it's always like, okay, well, we've certainly done that. What haven't we done? What can we do to push forward the idea of what art is? And I think making things that are purposely immature uh, is something that is not part of sort of like art history, I believe. And also, as you said, it reflects humanity. I mean, it's, it's art almost about the internet itself. Which is a really, you know, obviously that's not really been done before because the, Internet's the internet is a cultural phenomenon in its own right. Particularly, well, there's not, not just Twitter. Reddit has its own huge deep culture. There's tons of these cultures that are all there and they are really interesting. And that's another sort of like thing with it is it's many of the pictures are very coded and that the average person like... You know, like the, the 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 whole reason a lot of the like penises started is because everybody with Solana was going fucking boners for this thing. And oh my god, Solana is the fucking craziest thing ever. And everybody was just going ape shit. You know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, whatever. And so that's when I started like posting this stuff. And but like the average person, the average person doesn't even know what Solana is, much less this like. You know, and then this dog with hat thing and, and, you know, all these like old coins and stuff like that. Like, it's so coded in like all these, this, this subculture that that too is a part of the internet. That you have these subcultures and they, they have these languages that they um, build. And they're so insular and they're so, um, this like closed loop of sort of like information and sort of like inside jokes that it takes so long to like unpack and sort of like you know explain to the normal person what any of this means and and i i remember sort of like talking to my my nephew and and his like him trying to explain things to me and it would just take forever for him to explain things because he'd have to like explain like memes 
And it'd be like, he'd have to explain this. And he'd have to explain this. Yeah, we didn't have to explain this thing, this thing. And it's just like, oh my God, like people understand that. And he's like, yeah, it's the guy understood me. And it's like, oh my Jesus Christ. But it's so coded. And like, to me, I find that very interesting and, and something that I think is sort of like worth documenting. I mean, and as you said, you've kind of got the double layer of the internet at large. So like, um, I was thinking sometimes the people comes up behind me of um, of Giga Chad, for example. So yeah. that's kind of almost the internet at large, right? Which is Elon, his kind of where he really came onto the onto Twitter in 2020 or so, 2021, where he was kind of the owner of everything, even though before he bought it. But you've also, you've staked out that subculture of crypto and NFT, you know, that whole world and claimed that as part of what you're commenting on. And it is a massively strong subculture. It's huge. A hundred percent. I think that's, that's with a lot of these things, I mean. And it's full of drama as well, which is nice. It's full of drama. There's always stuff happening. And like, again, that's very new in my art. I wasn't documenting crypto culture before any of this sort of like NFT stuff. I only, you know, knew of it. And so the, the, that piece of it is, is kind of like quite new, but to me, the culture is like in many cases, or maybe I shouldn't say many cases in some cases that literally all there is because these things actually have no utility whatsoever. It is purely the memes behind them and the culture that surrounds them that gives them any value. And I think, yeah, the, the same could kind of be said of a lot of sort of like art, what gives it value is the sort of relevance that it has in culture and the amount that it's sort of connected with people and sort of given them enjoyment or given them a new way to think about life. And so to me, I think, um, yeah, I, I just find it to be a, a fascinating space that is always... I mean, I, now you got these fucking rocks people are going ape shit for, and it's like... I it's, knew I, I was going to buy a rock. I thought this is a no-brainer, the most dumbest art of, in the world. And I saw they were kind of at rock bottom, like, about a year ago. I'm thinking I've got to buy one. It's the most moronic move ever. I should have done it. I should have done it. Next minute, they're fucking Sotheby's. That's what's so funny, though, is that it, like... It's a culture that almost like, just like that, like the rock thing, like it prides itself on trying to find the like fucking dumbest things. Or you think about the, what was the, the, that monster, the uh, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. the Kevin's is just like, this is the dumbest thing. And then it's like, oh wait, this is actually the best thing. And it's just kind of like. Like, I don't know that that to me is like fascinating, too, that it's like. And the space is super smart. It's like Elon is like the smartest person in the world, but they all act dumb as shit and they celebrate it buying bonk tokens or dog with hat. And here you've got these kind of, you know, PhDs in nuclear physics buying this stuff and punting it. It's like it, it's hilarious. It's it to me is like so fascinating and and it's a little scary if i'm being honest because to me it really speaks to the idea that how fast technology is now moving and how fast these memes can like really sort of like take hold and affect people's real world decisions which they're just memes you know a lot of this stuff it's just like oh, okay i'm Oh, people are talking about this. Okay, I'm going to start talking about this. Okay, I'm going to start talking about this. And then it like spreads, but it can like literally spread to, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people in just this rapid amount of time. And there's no vetting of these ideas. It's just like they're, they're only sort of like vetting is how attractive they are from a viral standpoint. And I feel like that in the future is going to cause some issues. I think it probably is already. Fake news is just memetics by a different title, as is yeah. religion, as is everything else, right? 
It's yeah, stories so I, we tell ourselves. I, I agree, but I think it's going to become like very, like something's going to spread very quickly and it's going to be like, and a bunch of people are going to do something where it's like, oh shit, okay, yeah. That was that really like in the course of like a week like that really ramped up really quickly and like i don't know i just feel like it's i i, I agree i think it's already starting you're already just starting to see sort of like you know little lemmer and we'll get into the ai element later because that is going to fan those flames because you can rile up the people create a meme that doesn't exist create anything you want and manipulate not only emotion but a lot of outcomes so We'll talk about that. But before we get into the future, let's go back to the past. How the hell did you get into all of this? Because you were like an overnight sensation that took 25 years to get there as ever. You know, what, sure, what, sure. Was your, what was your story? Yeah, so I went to school for like computer science and kind of, um, you know, thought I was going to make video games. And then I saw somebody at school who... He was going to make video games. And when I saw that, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to make video games. You're going to make video games. You want that way better. And when I was in school, I realized I was spending all my time making digital art and posting on the internet. And this was 1999 to 2003. So before YouTube even. And so, um, you know, nobody was making me do that. I was just doing it in my free time. And so I realized this is what I actually want to do. I'm just going to get a job doing whatever the fuck I want and just put all my true time and passion into making digital art and there's no real way to sell it you know that wasn't like nobody what kind of art were you making then what what how were you expressing yourself so it was i was mainly making sort of like short films and they were very like tightly synced audio and video and they were very like abstract um there was no characters in them there was no sort of like um very much about color and form and and sort of um shapes and, and things like that and um i started you know kind of like posting those on my website and then in the, it, 2007 and i made a, a bunch of those and then in 2007 i obviously started the everydays and started posting those on my website and then in 2000 and what to t- talk me through before you why did you do that? Was that just a discipline thing or you just want to explore the idea? What, what was the idea you started? Every days? With? Yeah. Yeah, so for the every days and, and sort of, again, just making art has been... I'm not a very well-rounded person. Let's just say that. Like, I don't have, like, a bunch of other interests. Like, I, I really... My entire adult life has been pretty all-in on art. Um, and so I made... I mean, before I started the every days, I'd made, I don't even know, probably... 50, 60, like, short films and sort of, you know, many, many other sort of, like, experiments and things like that. So the Everydays really started um, just as a way to get better and sort of, like, uh, teach myself how to draw at first. I had saw an illustrator in the UK who did a sketch a day, and it was like, oh, that's... And and he had already done that, like, done a year of it. And I was like, oh, that's really cool being able to kind of, like, see, you know, all the sketches and, and sort of see that whole process. Um, so I was like, well, why don't, you know, I do that to, to get better at that making art. And so I did a year of that, and then I was sort of like, you know, I, I learned a lot about art. I was still very bad at drawing, um, but I learned a lot of techniques that I, I would have taken me a lot longer. And the basic trick of that is it just... The everyday is really just tricks you into working more. You know, when you're sort of like, okay, day's done, I'm, it's nine o'clock, you know, I'd really like to watch an episode of something or whatever. It's like, no, nah, two or more hours of making a picture. And so that's really it. So I was just working more. And so I was, you know, learning more or whatever. And I think having that, that deadline each day gives you a lot more opportunity to experiment and sort of like, well, I'm going to spend a couple of hours on this and then that will be that. And if it sucks, whatever, there's always, you know, tomorrow. And so, um, you know, it, I, it's on a, a huge sort of like much quicker level up in my skills. And so I was like, well, what if I use this to teach myself a 3D program? I didn't know any 3D programs. I'd always wanted to learn one. Everything I'd done to that point had been 2D. Um, and so I started doing a render a day in Cinema 4D, which is 
was not really like a thing. Like I'd never heard of anybody doing a, you know, a render like this per day. And so I started doing that and, and sort of really quickly learned, you know, that program and, and sort of, uh, was able to increase my skills really quick. And then in 2010, I released a video and it went kind of like viral in sort of like the art scene or whatever. And that's when it kind of like clicked for me that, and even a little bit before that, I started posting my work in, uh, in 2009 to Facebook. Um, but it kind of clicked to me with social media that it was like, I was spending all this time trying to get people to go to my website, which everybody did before social media. It's like, well, I, somehow I got to give people SEO. I got to get people to go to my website. And then it was sort of like, wait, everybody's already on Facebook and like they're starting to like use this Facebook thing a lot more. Why don't I just post my pictures on Facebook where everybody already is and then it'll just pop up and they can see the picture and it to do. And so I really kind of like, you know, pretty early sort of like understood the power of sort of like social media to be able to like reach people and then people could comment right there and everybody can see their comment and like you can have this sort of like immediate dialogue around the work um and so really from that point on i kind of was really pretty hyper focused on you know building a social media sort of like presence and and kind of having that be this big unlock for distributing my art because prior to that i was also entering a bunch of film festivals and you know with this abstract weird fucking digital art stuff that they weren't looking for they did not want and so i was getting rejected and paying these fees and stuff and then i started getting into some of them and i'd see the other shit that they'd have in the festival and it's like okay this fucking blows what why do i give a fuck what these people think anyway and so i realized like if i could just you know post things on social media i could reach people and sort of like build an audience there and not have to go through all the kind of like gatekeepers of of you know, sort of museums or galleries, da, 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 all the other sort of like normal kind of traditional modes of things. I could just reach people, a global but you audience. you didn't think you could sell anything at that point, right? Because there was no, no real it, mechanism to sell digital stuff, right? You no, know, it was not a mechanism to sell digital stuff. Basically, the, the kind of feedback loop there monetarily that I was experiencing was as I got more... Um, sort of followers and people saw my work more and around this time i also started releasing a bunch of creative commons like concert visuals sort of like short abstract like uh 10 to 15 seconds sort of like clips that people could use at concerts or djs could use behind them and so those started getting really popular too and so a bunch of people knew me just through like the vj clips and so then i started getting hired to do like concert visuals and then i started getting hired to do sort of like better and better kind of like freelance work and so to me that was it it was just sort of like okay i put out ideas on the internet for free and everybody does and then hopefully somebody looks at that and hires you for a freelance gig and and i was making really good money i was making like half a million dollars a year doing freelance work just myself with and really the cool stage settings i saw some of them at the, your studio they're like it's super cool stuff right yeah yeah i was you know by the end of it i was working on the super bowl halftime show and the democratic national convention and you know justin bieber and lady gaga and blah 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 all these like really cool shows and really cool gigs and i was doing stuff for apple and i did you know some stuff for spacex and and uh samsung and blah blah blah, blah, blah all these things and the spider-man movies concept art and like really cool gigs and, and awesome stuff magically and i was just like well that's it like that's yeah. i've Correct already it. on top of what a digital artist could possibly sort of do and and you know this is great and then, but I, but I still kind of had this inkling, even around that time, around 2019, I was like, I would like to see this stuff. When I started doing weird, weirder stuff, that's when I started doing weird stuff in like 2019. Not, before that, it was really quite normal. What, what switched? What switched is I realized that's what I truly wanted to do. I, was, I started making the images that the tiny voice in my head was like, you know, it'd be funny if you did that. And then it was like, 
And I would always be like, nah, I don't know if like, like I would never do political things. She was like, nah, that might be like piss people off. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't, that's, I don't know. I don't, it's too weird. I don't know. And then I kind of realized like, no, this is the actual interesting thing is that when I make something that's hyper specific for myself and go really hard on that, that is what resonates most with people. When I don't try and make what I think people would like and I make just what I would like and I assume nobody else will like it, those are the things people actually like the most because they can tell it it just has a level of authenticity that things don't have now because everything else is like trying to fucking sell you some shit, trying to like make some shit that's like a product versus if you make some super fucking hyper weird shit that people can tell like, wow, you did not get any fuck. If like <laughs> people like you, I'm you still throw, scarred by so much of your work. You I'm truly scarred. did not give a fuck if anybody liked this, man. You Be just, you were doing you, bro. You were doing you. And when you do that, it paradoxically resonates with people more than anything else. And so I kind of recognized that and the, the, the pieces started going sort of like much more viral as they were like way more what I actually wanted to make. And so I recognized it was like, this is something new too. And what would be really interesting is to see this hyper fucking weird shit in like a museum. Like that to me is like the ultimate sort of like an actual new voice of something that feels like it's not been done before. Um, and so I had like kind of this sort of like gallery type show in 2019 in Toronto. And it was, you know, sort of, it wasn't really at a gallery. It was just kind of an exhibition space. Um, but it had like a great turnout, you know, really huge, uh, amount of people saw it or whatever. And then I had a bunch of gallery shows planned for 2020 and, you know, that was actually through a real, you know, sort of like gallery or whatever. And then COVID hit and it was like, okay, well, I guess we'll just kind of, you know, put aside this whole breaking into the kind of more traditional art world, which, you know, I didn't really know how to do. I didn't know how it operated. I didn't really know how sort of like any of that, that galleries worked. And I, and I wasn't having the, sh the gallery shows to sell things. I was just having them to show the work. Um, and then the nft stuff hit and it was like oh you know where did you see what was your what was your genesis point where was your the so seed my thing from by that time so over the last you know sort of 20 years of, of kind of releasing work and sort of through the everydays and the short films and i would also release the like project files for my short films so that was like another thing that nobody really did and sort of like gave me a lot of, of followers through that um and the VJ clips, um, I had amassed, you know, a couple million followers by the time I learned of NFTs. And so those followers sort of kept kind of bugging me and being like, I think you should look at this NFT thing. I think you should look at this. And as a, a, a number of times I, lo I looked at it and it was just like, what in the fuck is this? This is not for me. This is some like crypto thing. This has nothing to do with what I'm doing. Like the fuck are you guys talking about? And like, I'm pretty sure I went to like, the Flamingo Dows. I, I vaguely remember going to like Flamingo Dow site. And I was like, a Dow? What the fuck is this? This has nothing. What are you guys talking about? This has nothing to do with what I do. And then people kept bugging me like, really? I think you should look at this. And then I looked at it and I went to Super Rare. And I, I looked at all of the like top selling artists. And then it was like, wait a second, I recognize these people. These are people that are in my, like, you know, sort of like uh, crowd uh, of sort of like digital artists and 3D artists or whatever. And they're selling JPEGs for like tens of thousands of dollars. Like, what the fuck? And then I was sort of like, okay, I'm more popular than all of these people. If they could sell JPEGs for like $10,000... Why the fuck couldn't I sell J for ten thousand dollars? And so it really like clicked. And it, right at that time too, it also sort of like clicked that it was like, wait a second, this is what stopped digital art from being part of the broader art world. There's no like 
real way to collect it. There's no way to collect it that sort of like is meaningful. And this process isn't new. The process of all you had was like deviant art, and you could show it in deviant art. People, get, but what do you do with it? That's it. You could show it, and and you could collect it, but you had to print it out, or you had to, you know, give somebody a zip drive or a floppy disk or whatever. Uh, all these ways that didn't really resonate with people as like a real like way of collecting, and nobody was looking at it really in like a collecting sort of like mindset, and so. I realized at that time that this was not a new process, that this had happened with other art forms. Photography, that's not art, that's just photography, that's craft, that's not actual art. Uh, uh, street art, that's graffiti, that's not art, that's, that's graffiti, that's not art. Co vinyl collectibles, those are just toys, that's not art, those are just toys for kids to like collect. And then with all of those things, then it was sort of like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess it is art. And then it became part of like actual sort of quote unquote art. And like, so this was, this was that moment with digital art. And like, I could like feel that. And it was like, wait a second. Wow. I feel like I am actually the most popular digital artist. <laughs> like at this moment where this thing is like going like fucking crazy and it was like wow this is like fucking like nuts or whatever and so then I, you know very quickly after that like click happened like as soon as it like clicked it immediately clicked and then i was like okay i'm fucking done with the client work i'm gonna try and like figure out if i can like do this thing like and so i immediately just like then i talked to Pac. You know, um, immediately after I saw that super thing, I immediately texted him. And I was just like, Pac was the, the number one selling artist on there. I'm like, okay, I know Pac. Immediately texted him, Pac, what the fuck is going on here? What? what? <laughs> and so we had this big, long chat um, where he was trying to explain it to me. And he, you know, kind of explained the collectors and the, the sort of, you know, how the, the sort of ecosystem worked with the marketplaces and all this stuff. And then from there, I just like completely just like... <sighs> This is the fucking thing. Immediately, like, within the next week, I had talked to the founders of Nifty Gateway, Super Rare. I would talked to X Copy. I would talked to blah, blah, blah. Like, everybody I could fucking get on a Zoom with. It was like, guys, what the fuck is going on? And I talked to Coley. I talked to, like, you know, everybody I, I, I could to sort of, like, understand this. And then I think my next drop was, like, two weeks later. And so it was like, and then we were just, we were fucking off to the races because it was like, and immediately just like, this is the fucking thing. It also combined, you know, a lot of the things. It combined everything that I was interested in. I would say the only other sort of tiny side um, interest I have besides art is like sort of like fine, not finance, but like, you know, I would kind of like trade stocks, retail sort of like stocks and sort of keeping up with that and again not like crazy degen or whatever i was actually pretty sort of conservative or whatever but that was was interesting to me the like stock market so here's this thing that you know i felt like i was kind of utiliz utilizing my computer science degree a little art and then this you know a mix of sort of like investing and so i was like okay this is a fucking thing like i was i was all there how do you think about it now you don't make an nft every day no because you sold um, the 2020 and the 2021 collections, and they were relatively limited NFTs, and you obviously had the big one of one um, that, that became very famous. But then how do you, what do you do now in that respect? Because you're still producing the work every day. Yeah, so we're still making uh, every day. Is are they commissioned now, or how does that work? No, they're just like literally just like the same way before. It's just like make whatever the fuck I want. And then people sometimes are like, hey, can I buy that one? And it's like, sometimes I say yes, and sometimes I say no. Um, most of the time I say no. And so um, that's kind of how we are. I, I will say I would like to, and that's one of the things on my kind of to-do list, is make the process of the everydays more on-chain so that I'm... 
minimally having some record on chain of each every day. I feel like that is something that yeah, I... Yeah, regardless of monetization or change of ownership, it's like they should be stored permanently. That's the whole point. A hundred percent. And so that is um, one of the things... I, I think what's what's kind of stopped me from doing that is not knowing how to do that um, in a way that feels authentic. But that is something I really do need to sort of like crack because I think right now they exist, you know, in a smattering of social media shit that who the fuck knows I could piss off Elon or piss off Mark and we'll just go ahead and shut that down. We'll go ahead and turn the volume down on you. And so that to me again is sort of one of the things that I think is really, you know, great about the blockchain is that it is decentralized and it's like, no, no, I'm not keep fucking posting whatever the fuck I want. And so, um, yeah, I think, figuring out a good meaningful way to sort of like and I, I had a bunch of ideas of how that could happen i think um that is sort of the next kind of like evolution of the everydays is is bringing that so if any listeners have any suggestions on how we could approach it because again there's a lot of different ways like yeah i could just mint a fucking nft every day but it's sort of like well also uh, they're not I mean, the inscriptions idea is closer to what you're thinking of. Because, again, it still lives on an AWS server as an image. You know, this, it's kind of, it's still not perfect. So, yeah. No, and that's the other thing. And, and the inscriptions and stuff like that and, like, having it be actually on chain. I mean, these are, you know, 4K files every day that are, you know, 25 meg. And so it's like, it's got to be, I, I think, having at least some record of the metadata or some way of putting it at least somewhat on chain i'm not personally a huge like every fucking thing needs to be 1000 percent on chain because at the end of the day i think the things that we value regardless of the aws going down or blah 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 like it's backed up other places and so i think the things that we want to um, save culturally that are important to us, we will save. I mean, you look at Nam June Pike, you know, uh, installations and, and sort of like TV sculptures or whatever. We keep those working. We keep old Apple IIe computers working that we, you yeah, know. Yeah, Damien Hurst shark in formaldehyde that's still you know, surviving. Now, they take you know. the fucking shark out, change the fucking formaldehyde, whatever, like, or paintings that are hundreds of years old. It's sort of like, okay, it's covered in, you know, 300 years of shit. Clean it off, you know, touch it up, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's the thing. If, if culture still values it in the future, they will find a way to preserve it. And it will only get easier as we have more and more tools in the future to preserve these sort of like old things. Unless, of course, there's some, I don't know, fucking AI fucking, I don't know, apocalypse or whatever. It will get easier to preserve things. What was it like for you going from the digital world and that kind of, not corporate, but, you know, professional career... You don't figure out NFTs, great. Suddenly, the trad art world comes to you. That must have been kind of weird. Suddenly, you know, you've got the auction houses and people like Tico Magrabi and all of the people suddenly coming into your sphere, realizing that you're onto something new. What was that like? It must have been kind of surreal. It was definitely very surreal because I think it's, it, was, it was a surreal moment sort of um, just creating all of this stuff and then <laughs> it just felt way too good to be true because it was sort of like, it was like, here's all this stuff you've already been doing. That's great. You already felt like you had gotten, you know, again, I was like making good money. It was sort of like, okay, and, and gotten, you know, recognition. I've got, you know, millions of followers and all these great clients and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, oh, 
So all that stuff you've been doing, it's even way more valuable than you thought. And it's like, oh, okay, wait, really? Really? All this stuff? So all these pictures that I've already made before that I thought I'd already gotten, you know, the full sort of like value and whatever, you know, uh, sort of good, good graces or whatever positive outcomes from these making these pictures. There's even way more than that. It's like, okay, <laughs> like it's just... Uh, it, it was definitely very surreal, but I think, um, you know, it, it, to me is, is such a like bigger moment than that. And, and something that I just feel very, very, very humbled to be, you know, a part of, because again, I didn't invent NFTs. I didn't invent this blockchain. I had to be dragged and fucking like convinced that it was like, you know, something that would be super sort of like beneficial to me. And, and I just sort of, you know, kind of happened to be uh, this very, very popular artist at um, a time when everybody was locked in their houses and starting to sort of like, hmm, what are these JPEGs things? And what if we gamble on those? <laughs> you know what I mean? And but, so, But yeah. also there's an element of, you kind of had the right art at the right time. So I always think of as art as a snapshot of culture. And with this cult, this culture got kind of super condensed because of the pandemic. So everyone was at home. So here's the internet culture. It's our only culture now because we can't fucking get out of our houses. Yeah. On top of it is crypto really starts coming into the mainstream as people are starting to understand that the governments are printing money and all of this big thing. And then the art of that period is the essence of culture. And if I go back and look at art of any period, whether it was like, I was lucky enough to grow up in the late 90s in London, which was Damien Hirst, Tracy Emin. It was all about Blur, it's Oasis. London was the epicenter of everything. Sure. And that will always have value, Damien Hirst, because it is just a snapshot of that. Yep. Like Warhol is a snapshot of the 60s, the counterculture revolution and the commercialization and all of that stuff. And that's what I see this now. And it really strikes me. Um, it really struck me yet again um, when we were at your place at the studio a few weeks ago is when you look around a room and everybody's one degree of separation from anybody who matters anywhere. Yeah. And we're not talking about it's a bunch of artists with their noses up or art galleries no no it's finance people technology people art people um trad art people random people who've just come into this space and you're like this and musicians everything and you're like okay this is special this yeah. feels like the really early stage of something that this uh -huh. magic won't be around in five years time yeah, a hundred percent, and and uh, I couldn't agree more. It it really like feels like a moment that um, is just so special, and and the amount it was a number of people to your point that you could kind of fit your whole head around it. You know what I mean? And yeah, it was, that's right. Like you could fit your head around, and it was a bunch of different things too. It was sort of like, you know, all of these crazy PFPs and, and sort of all the, the generative stuff and all the, the other, you know, x copy and, and sort of more uh, just other types of, of digital artists, um, all sort of like converging. And, you know, nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows the rules of this. Everybody's trying new things. Everybody's seeing what everybody else is trying and is in, inspired by them to, oh, okay, I see how they tried that. What if we did that, but then sort of like mix in this technology or this sort of aesthetic? And like things are, you know, uh, becoming very popular very fast and then very not popular very fast and and just this sense of just a crazy sense of community um you know around it that to me it just is very i don't know it's this <laughs> it's like a weird mix of like pvp fucking 
zero sum game fucking you know fuck you pay me and also very supportive because it's like <laughs> obviously there's money being traded and that's a big piece of it i'm not like so naive to be like this is just about beautiful art and fucking jeez. It's like, okay, no, no, no. It's, it's, there's a lot about, it's kind of a lot about money. It's kind of a lot about money. Um, but then there is really also to me that element of like, you know, something more, I don't know, cultural and something special about it that, that does, I feel like kind of, I don't know. Make it not just about money. Uh, it's not. I don't. I think it's culture has value. It always does. Music. You know why we like music, particularly why we like vinyl, is because it's like it's like an NFT of your music. It's a it's a thing, and you and it's got that moment in time. It's like yeah. you know, I collect rock and roll photographs because they're a moment in time and. They're signed by the artist, and that kind of captures it, and stuff like that. So, you know, I think it's great. Who else do you think are the artists and that that will be remembered from this moment in time? X Copy seems to be one because he ca he seemed to be completely. He was like somewhere between Basquiat and Banksy, just you yeah. know, doing his own crazy English thing. I think he's, to me, I, he strikes me as being very much like ba Basquiat in a way, that it's this sort of like digital kind of like um, very expressive sort of uh, art. But he also gets the culture of the internet and of crypto and all of it. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And and that's why immediately after coming into the space, it was like, who is this? It, which I never heard of him before this, the... Um, you know, sort of coming into this space and was like, X copy, He's, this name seems to be coming up quite a lot. And Josie Bellini was another one I talked to very early on, too. Um, but yeah, I, I think definitely, you know, his stuff will work around. I, I think, you know, Eric with the squiggles obviously has been, you know, a massive sort of like moment and, and Tyler with the Fidenzas. I think those are things that really, you know, showed people the value of, of, generative art in in this new sort of like space because obviously generative art is is not new but i think in combining it with with the blockchain you know it had this multiplier effect that i think people saw the other thing i think is really interesting is rafik has kind of t taken that and turned it up to 11 yeah 100 percent. rafik i think that the way he's sort of like showing people um sort of uh, you know i i think his work is is really kind of showing is very accessible to people and and is something where they can see it and it almost well, there's no cocks in it generally right there's there's very few there are some there are some <laughs> and i think it's something where it for me it's like an animated jackson pollock and yeah. so it connects it, it has enough of the old language of you know almost looking like splattered paint that it like people can see that abstraction in it and it connects with something they already know, but it's something obviously very new that it bridges that in a way that is very accessible to people They're like, Oh, okay. I see how this digital art can be something that has a connection to, or, or can affect an emotional connection in me. You know what I mean? Versus I think, to the average person, a lot of my stuff is kind of like, whoa, what the fuck is that? Like, it's it's definitely, it's almost like too... My too wife goes past my two peoples that I've collected and she's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, look, it's... I, I, I don't even bother explaining. I said, look, it doesn't matter. It's almost like too jarringly different from what you've seen in the past that it's like, what the fuck is that? Like, and so... I think, um, yeah, I, th I think, but I think all of these things, you know, are sort of like pushing in different directions and pushing, um, pushing our idea of what art could be, what an artist could be, um, you know, in new ways that I think will have sort of have 
ripple effects, you know, sort of over time. And you and I talked uh, quite a lot about uh, recently about the new mediums that are coming as well, because the mediums are changing, right? Things are becoming more 3D. And, yeah. you know, you are a boomer and don't think the Apple glasses are valuable. I, yeah. I just think you're just being short-sighted and that just give it one iteration and you'll be designing 3D. Dude, one land. iteration. You are out of your fucking mind, man. One iteration. That Suddenly was the awesome. Midwest boomer came out and you, oh, nobody's ever oh, going to wear these. Not this, really. okay, I'm taking off the fucking pullover. I'm fucking pissed. Off. No, the... Um, <laughs> That's the thing. One iteration, like these things aren't 50% smaller from being like mainstream. They literally, to be mainstream enough where you would wear them and not be literally ridiculed, they would need to be, I believe, 95% smaller. I don't even think if they were 10% of what they were, 10% would still be like some pretty big fucking glasses. I, I believe they would literally so, need okay, 95% look, smaller. We'll, we'll agree that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I haven't got that. I won't even buy the first iteration because I, you know, I can see the same thing. They're, they're too clunky. I assume it'll get better over time. What I'm really interested in this, I want your take on it. It definitely will get better in time. I think, I, I think the thing that maybe I, I was not clear about that, though, is it's more so like I just was hoping because I'm such a fucking dork that they would make glasses that I could wear all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it. I just wanted, like, like yes, this is what it will be eventually, but I wanted something right now that I could wear all the time. You know what I mean? I do. What, where my head is at with this is because I tend to live a bit in the future on, on stuff, looking at macro trends, is I'm thinking, okay, I've heard your story. You started... In the early days of the internet, you started using digital art. So computers came first. You could make digital art. You couldn't make them discoverable. Nobody could see them. You have to use a floppy disk. So suddenly the internet comes. It's a bit clunky, but your early days, right? And there's a few artists from that period, not many. And I'm seeing a new medium arising in front of us, and somebody is going to understand its future importance like you did of the internet. And that's what I'm thinking about. It's like... There is something so huge in an AR world where all around us we can have 3D objects. That Absolutely. is exciting. I 100% agree. And, and I 100% agree that AR will be the next um, iteration of sort of like computing and in the way that we sort of went from the desktop computer to kind of the internet, the sort of the smartphone, the next one, I believe, will, will very much be, be AI or a AR. Um, and I think uh, that will be quite profound. And I think the ability to have artistic experiences where everything is, is really kind of on the table there. I mean, you could, I, I think there will be filters. I think there will be in the future artists who literally just make filters that change the way you see the world and they will be very popular. And like, I think some people will literally just walk around the world with filters on that like make everything look a certain way. And it'll be like, they haven't actually seen fucking what real things look like and who the fuck knows how long because they just, we're, Everything looks like a fucking Van Gogh painting to them. Um, and so I think there's there's many things like that. And I think... And it's not that far away, really. What's up? It's not that far away in time. No, I don't think it's that far away, but it's just not here now. You know what no. I mean? Like, it's not... And so, to me, it's, it's definitely something that I can fucking geek out and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, imagine and imagine all the crazy things. And, and I did a bunch of... Um, concept work for magic leap and so i really thought a lot about when ar is when we're all seeing the same thing in ar like there's so many cool things with that like i mean just just tiny interactions with like leaving little objects around the house that your family members could discover like i did a bunch of work with that just like you know pranks you could play on people that you could like 
you know, I did this one video where there's like somebody put a bunch of like poopy diapers in this like <laughs> fucking living room and like, you know, their friend, their friend would come home and be like, what the fuck is this? And there's like a bunch of dogs everywhere with it. And like, you know, you could leave your wife flowers virtual flowers on the counter so when she came down for breakfast it's like oh wow here's this flowers and it's this giant you know it's not just like a a vase that you could get flowers it's some crazy fucking flower thing that's like you know this massive thing or whatever and so you know you could have little little virtual friends that are walking around your like fucking you know desktop right here and like telling you stuff and like you know, there's just a bazillion different, you know, crazy things that will happen from that. And so to me, it's super, super exciting and, and um, something that I think will be, you know, will very much change how we look at this stuff. Because too, you you will be able to sort of live with, with digital art in a way that is still pretty cumbersome. I see you have like a screen behind you now. But yeah, and with- that to- token frame, I think they've gone bust because I can't reconnect the wallets i bought a bunch of nfts recently i can't it's like it's so clunky still to be able to display stuff but this will be like completely trivial to just be like here's this here's this here's this here's this the switches you know and i mean like you could just within you know i I believe you'll be able to literally just press a button because it already will be able to see where your walls are it knows the jpegs you have and it's just like put these jpegs arrange them on my walls it was like puts them all on your walls and it'll just be like switch and it'll just be like switch them to a new fucking set and it'll just be like permanent there you won't have to like keep placing them there it'll be like whenever you walk into this room this is what you fucking see and like you could have a, a 3d sculpture in the like thing that's you know doing all kinds of crazy shit and animated and whatever and that switches out automatically and these things are permanent they're like they're just you see it every time you look over there you're not like going into the app it's just and you'll be wearing glasses like your own just regular glasses and before you're just wearing it all day and so like your environment that you just take for granted and these passive things that are there that's just these passive things that are like in your environment all the time and they're all kinds of virtual digital objects yeah i i very much am super super excited for for that to kind of become a reality so Generative art showed us that we can use AI to make art, right? And my the first my first thesis of this AI to AGI stuff is we use it to augment ourselves first, and then eventually it does a lot of things itself. Question is, is I don't know if you saw there was this paper written randomly on Twitter about how an AI model had never been shown music or introduced music kind of discovered music it was, no, it, was it was freaky and i'm just thinking do these things discover art themselves do robots like art you know do they i think it's, it's gonna be really interesting what it does with creativity it it i i agree and i think it's really like the ai uh image generators got so good so fast that it really to me redefined my definition of what creativity even is because it was sort of like i didn't really think they would be able to draw images that well and that creatively from just very simple prompts and the writing is the same way it's sort of like, because I, I, you're so used to, you know, we're, we've all become so used to like, well, whatever you want the computer to do, you have to hyper specifically tell it. It can't think for itself. It can't have any level of like creativity. There's, there's no concept of creativity. It's ones, zeros, do this, do that, do this, do that, period. And now it's sort of like, You give it something and it's like, oh, that's an interesting idea I never thought of. And like, that's, that's new. It coming up with something where you're like, oh, that never occurred to me. Because again, this, it was like, I have to tell you exactly what I want and maybe you'll do it and maybe you won't, but you're certainly not going to surprise me. I mean, what kind of made my head spin is I started talking to my chat GPT-4. I don't know if you've used used the talk function. 
<laughs> and it talks back to you in the natural voice with the right pauses. Oh, no, I'm not used that. <laughs> so most people chat and it types it out. No, no, no. You're, you're missing the, the entire gig. The entire gig is you press the button, you talk to it, say, hey, chat GPT, blah, 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 blah. You know, why is people obsessed with dicks? And it will come back and you have this conversation for hours. I've literally had two-hour conversations. That's really great. interesting that's rabbit that. holes. It's amazing. That, so amazing. that's what the I usually do it on the like web version. That's what the app I assume. Uh, it's on the app on the phone, and it's yeah, yeah, really yeah. quick. You choose the kind of voice, and it's not like Siri. It's yeah, yeah. like it it pauses in the right thing. It speeds up right. words. It does stuff. It's it, like, it it is crazy how it's just like even with the typing, like it just really does not feel like you are talking to a computer. It feels like you are talking to a person in a way that is both very exciting to me and very kind of unsettling that it's like, Jesus fucking Christ. And like, even to the point where, you know, I'm sure you've experienced where you kind of like, you're like, no, I don't think so. And then it'll kind of like rethink or it'll be like, yeah, yeah, you're kind of right. And it's like, what the fuck is like, did I just convince the computer of something or like, it's like, there's just, it's so bizarre. it's like, I was actually watching, um, I don't know if you remember the movie AI, Artificial Intelligence. Yeah, by yeah, yeah. Kubrick. I actually just rewatched it, part of it, um, just like maybe like six months ago. And it was, you know, their basic, this was in, I think the year 2000 or something like that. And it was their vision of what artificial intelligence would be in the future. And it was so fucking stupid. It would just seem so dumb because it was like, hello, mommy. I am man, man, man. like, it was like, like, it felt like it was from the fifties. Like it was like, nope, that's not how it's going to be. Like, like it's just so robotic and so like, no, no, that's not how AI turned out. It's not robotic at all. It's going to be really fucking not like that like i could i just shut it off it was like it, this is like so dumb this is just like feels so fucking stupid now it's so clearly not the future you know um I, I don't know if you've been seeing that now they've got some of these large language models that can now fit on a, a mobile phone chip so yeah yeah and people go oh yeah 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 when you try and explain to people okay i can take that phone and go to a different planet and reboot humanity yeah. as a civilization because all of the history of human civilization is on that fucking chip. Yeah. People, again, people still think of this thing as like a Google search that's a bit smarter that talks yeah. to you. I'm like, no, no, no. This is all knowledge. We've possibly fed it so far. Sure, there's some ancient pap papyrus manuscripts we haven't fed through it yet, but they will come. And it has everything. So if you think of like an NFT as NFT art as a time capsule of culture, these large language models are a time cap capsule of all of humanity. Yeah. I think that's, that is what's very like crazy about it because I always, and, and kind of what I say about uh, sort of rethinking creativity and rethinking to me, what it even means to be like fucking human, to be honest. And because I was always under the sort of impression that the last two jobs on earth before the machines took all the jobs were going to be artists and, and musicians program. No, well, yeah. artists would fun or, or musicians or whatever and programmers. And now it's like, mm, I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> no, me neither. It's pretty good at art and it's pretty good at programming. Uh, okay, what else we got here? And so... Uh, there was a friend of mine, I just did an interview um, with uh, a guy called Duro, Um And he was, Oleg, Duro Oleg. His view is that there is a human element that people pay a premium for. And his idea is like, if you think of the OnlyFans economy, it's like humans seek attention. So most of OnlyFans is not actually about the pornography or anything else. It's actually to have your name read out or whatever it is. It's to make you feel like you, you're recognized or seen. 
or yep. heard. And obviously AI will do a whole bunch of that stuff and you won't be able to tell the difference, but you'll still pay for some sort of human premium because yep. humans are still humans. You can't mate, you can't yet mate with the machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that to me, like now I actually think the last jobs are something that will be much more like empathetic or very, like again, like you said, that's something that you can only get from like humans. Yeah, that, that, that sort of like machines can't really kind of like replicate. And so to me, it's it's just, I don't know, it's been super, I mean, this right on the heels of all the NFT shit, it's just like, what? I don't know. It's moving too oh, fast. You know, right? Especially just... because it's just moving so fast. And it's just kind of like, you know, this whole like, oh, look at it, can't do hands. Like, I thought that was going to be like, that was going to be a sack. And then it was like, oh, like fucking six months later, it's like, yeah, no, we can do hands now. And yeah, it's no, like, it's now photo perfect. Photo perfect with like three word prompt. And Look in office, you know. The last like three versions of Mid Journey, I've been like, okay, but how could it be better? Like it's like, oh, Mid Journey five, and it's like that. I don't. It's already like perfect. How could it be better? And then you see the side by side. It's like, fuck, it is better. Jesus Christ! <laughs> and then the next, the last version of Mid Journey six, which is like, well, that can't be better. Like it's again, it was perfect. How could it be better? And you see, and it's like, fuck, it is actually still better. What the fuck, like. And so it, it's just... I mean, I, I'd hate to be a Hollywood filmmaker because that's coming fast too. It is coming fast. And I think that to me is like, I think, you know, there there's such, I think, kind of fear in a lot of the, the sort of like artist community around this that I think is just not... I get it. Um, and I think it's going to be very disruptive in kind of the short term in that everybody's expectations are going to need to sort of like move up. Um, and, and this is not new. This has always been the case. Again, you look at sort of 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it was sort of like, does my business need a website? It was just like, I mean, not all businesses need websites. I mean, maybe your business needs a website. And then it was like, no, every business needs a website. I mean, for a while, it was like, does my business even need a logo? And it's like, I don't know, maybe it's just in the fucking, you know, white pages, yellow pages or whatever. It doesn't really need a logo. Who cares? And then it was like, no, it needs a logo. And then it was like, well, does my business need a social media presence? It's like, nah, maybe. I mean, it couldn't. Be bad. And then it was like, nope, definitely needs a social media presence. And now it's like, does my video, does my company need, you know, to have any sort of like videos made for it? For a long time, it was like, video, well, that's very expensive. You're not going to be able to make videos. You probably don't need that. Now it's like, nope, you definitely need videos. And so these things like, it sort of like it will continue to level set up like this. Like now it's sort of like, does my company need like a feature link documentary? It's like almost no companies have that. And it'll be like, well, that's one week of work. Like, yeah, I could have a feature link documentary. Like, it's like, you know what I mean? That explains exactly what your company does and its ethos and da 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 blah, 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 blah. And like that before would have been like, well, we're not going to spend $2 million making a feature link documentary. It's like, well, now that's $2,000. But how do we deal with that much abundance of content in, in any way, shape or form? Just more of everything. Because everything gets cheaper, faster, cheaper, faster, cheaper, faster. And it's already overwhelming for us, you know. You know, watch a good day on Twitter. A good day on Twitter is when something shocking has happened, particularly in crypto Twitter, because that's fun. Everybody's losing their shit. The day finishes with your post, which is an encapsulation of the complete shit show that went on. And, like, you are exhausted at the end of the day because there's so much content and stuff. And, you know, there's everything is happening. And we're just going to speed that up. And I don't even know how we cope. Or do you just turn off the machine and go and step outside or something? I, yeah, that I don't know. I mean, it definitely will even be way, way more. And I think it will be, I mean, it's just going to get more and more personalized and more and more, I mean, I think about the number of like photos we all take now. 
It's like, I, I look at when I was like, you know, I'm 42. And the amount of photos of me from like age zero to like five is like, I mean, I don't know. My parents probably, there's probably like a hundred, maybe 200. I don't know. Like, you know, not, not none, but not thousands, you know, and that's five years of my like thing. Now you could go a weekend and I take like fucking, you know, we generate 200 pictures of our fucking kids. And fucking the HD video and blah, 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 da, 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 and all this shit. And so it's like, uh, like, I don't even know. It's, it's. 6529 like, just said, keep taking the photographs because it's important and let the AI catch up because he will sort it out for you so he can resurface all of that. And I, yeah. that stopped me in my tracks. I thought, you know, that's exactly the right way of putting about it. Just because we can't sort all this shit now, all the stuff that's on my phone. The AI will sort that all out. Yeah. And understand and I what that, it is I want to see and when. I think that could be it. Because at the at the end of the day, we only have so much bandwidth and time. And there's still only going to be 24 hours in a day. And so much shit you could see before you're like, uh, too much. And I, I think that's where the AI really could sort of like, you know, really pick out those things that are really going to be like, this is the thing. You know, I mean, that's that's basically what these social media feeds are now and this will have your biometrics or whatever it is so it's going to know you're feeling kind of miserable when you show a picture that's going to make you laugh you know this it, it, it will do some amazing things with that whole it's your history i also think we become we will end up with photographic memory because you know if my apple mac here now as soon as they input a chip it'll see this conversation it'll know for forever everything we talked about yeah it'll see every twitter Thing I've ever read, everything I've ever read, everything I've ever written, anybody's ever talked to, and I'll have a photographic memory of it forever. And that's where I think, again, the glasses are going to be crazy because they'll be like looking at everything and under, not just looking at it and recording it like stupid, like looking at it, recording it and logging it and understanding it. And so just like you said, you're sitting there like, you know, if I get on, remember when I talked to Raul, blah, 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 boom, there's the thing. And it's just like, oh, there's the thing. Let's scroll on through. Yeah, that. Remember when he said, da, 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 play that clip. And it was, bit, and it was just like, boom, there's that fucking clip. And it's like, it it will, yeah, I, I think that, that will be crazy too. Again, when we're all constantly wearing recording devices and recording everything going on in a way that's immediately searchable and indexed without any input on ours. It's not like, oh, I got a fucking, okay, where are the meta tags for this photo? Blah, 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 blah. It's like, nope. It understands exactly what's going on. It understands what you're doing. And like, I was thinking about that too. Actually, it was kind of freaky. Like thinking about it in the context of it understanding what you are understanding the relationships you have around you and what if it's sort of like oh my god i can't believe she said that <laughs> blah, blah, she's not good for you she's blah, not blah, good blah, 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 blah happened two weeks ago and she's fucking bringing that up and like that's the fucking voice you hear in your fucking head and it could be trying to start shit and it's like or it could be like okay remember when two weeks ago that thing happened and like you know, their dad is going through da 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 so, like, give them patience, blah, blah, blah. And it could start affecting, because it is very acutely aware of all of our social, like, fucking what's going on. It's recording everything and understands and hears everything. It could really be this sort of, like, voice that kind of, no, 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 is kind of just helping us sort of choose how to act. And it's like, well, that is a very scary thought that I never really occurred to me. The other thought that, uh, you, you came up with when we were chatting that I just thought was brilliant uh, and it really made me stop and think it's like you were like whoever the fuck gets, comes first with AGI they're just going to win all of the money in the markets oh yeah that actually scared <laughs> the shit out of me when I thought of that when we were talking the other day too I was like because I'd actually never really thought of that either I was like what if somebody basically comes up with something that just can like win the market and it just suddenly becomes, starts amassing like fucking, it figures out. Because again, 
there's tiny patterns in the stock market. And when you find those tidy patterns, you can become Sam Bakeman freed and figure out this little fucking arbitrage thing and make yourself some money. But what if you were even better than that and you were able to like start really scooping up the money and to the point where everybody is sort of like, well, he knows the fucking secret sauce here. I'm going to give him my money. And then it becomes this like, that's where again, the meme thing where it's suddenly in the course of three weeks or a weekend, somebody suddenly is like, okay, so that person just over the weekend amassed $2.7 trillion. This is, and then what do you do? Like, do you shut it down because somebody has... Well, how do you shut it down if somebody's winning the stock market? Now, we know there's kind of renaissance technologies and everyone will be thinking this, oh, there's some smart people already doing it. I'm talking like at every time horizon and everything all at once everywhere so nobody else can make money. You know, theoretically, something like that is possible. And as you say, if somebody goes, hey, I've just broken the secret to all of trading and all of investment... I'm just opening this ETH wallet. Send me your ETH. I'll invest it. As you say. A- and who would not give this person your money? And then again, all of the fucking money is like <laughs> fucking like gobbles up to one thing. And then it's like, again, you can't just be like, okay, well, we're just going to pause the stock market because this person's winning everything. All the global stock markets and cu- currency. We'll stop everything. And we'll tell this guy, ask him nicely not to do this. Yeah, like, so then what the fuck do you even do? That's where I truly believe one person or one team could literally fuck everything up. And then it's sort of like, because again, what do you, exactly to your point, what are you going to be like, please, sir, let us morons play this fucking dumb, dumb game and you don't play because you're going to take all of our fucking like, Marbles. (laughs) Marbles. <laughs> uh, dum-dums to keep playing our game and trading marbles back and forth. You're taking too many of them. I don't even know what you do then. And like, it's almost, I almost feel like, like then it was, it actually freaked me out when I thought of it because then I was like, wait a second. I stepped, I, when I left there, it, it was stuck in my head the entire time. Maybe like, me too. And I had just thought of it just as I was talking to you, to be quite honest. And then I was like, and then I was hoping you were going to give me like, no, but this would happen. So that couldn't happen. And it was like, he knows way more about finance than me. And he didn't come up with any reason that couldn't happen. Then I was really freaked out. (laughs) I was hoping you'd be like, no. So the reason that wouldn't happen is because X, Y, Z. And I was like, oh, he's not really coming up with a rebuttal for this. No, because even if it doesn't get every trade right, if it gets 80% of trade right and does enough trades, it just takes all the money on earth. Dude, I don't even think it would need to do with that because you would, again, the flywheel effects of, if it was getting like, if you could just beat the market by like 20% or 30%, like you don't even need to get anywhere close to 80% of your fucking trades right. You need to get like, I mean, if, if you're fucking, you know, how many, what, what do you think even fucking Warren Buffett or one of these people, he's wrong. Yeah, the best traders in the, best traders in the world are about, some of them are below 50%, but they just stop losses plus running their winners the best on average are maybe 60 percent winners but what does that mean how are you saying like 60 percent winners like what? so you do 100 trades in a in a month 60 percent of them make money now okay. and 40 percent lose money because unlike twitter people actually lose money in trading as well you know twi- <laughs> twitter just suggests that nobody loses money that we've all just made billions god gotcha. generally yeah. So you're saying, okay, so if it was like, so 60% 60 at what rate? Yeah, that's right. If you could do lots of them all the time, it it, it really does depend. I I need to think it through properly because there's stuff like time horizon. Do you want to capture the millisecond stuff? Or do you just say, I know that the dollar is going to go up 50% over the next five years. I'm just going to put a bazillion dollars into one trade you know there are trades that can do everything you know if you'd have yeah, yeah. The, the code for the pandemic it's you could just go like, straight to elon musk wealth overnight yeah i think it's more like i'm looking at this as not like overnight but something that could in say um 
a couple weeks or a couple months suddenly amass like oh shit okay this is now the like the biggest like uh company in the world and it literally just sprung up three months ago and it's now worth you know 4.5 trillion dollars <laughs> and it's sort of like and it's 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 button right pretty quick and and then it's that because at that point it would be controlling the game a bit more yeah. because it's so big and then it's sort of like it can see what it's doing is fucking affecting the markets and it can see the psychology of like the fucking game theory of all this shit okay i'm gonna buy this shit nobody expects me to buy that and then i'm gonna fucking do this and i'm gonna fucking blah 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 and like then this government's gonna say this and then, then like it can just basically fucking game it out and it's sort of like what are the humans gonna do if they take the last great game away i mean because they've beaten the the machines have beaten us at chess beaten us at go beaten us at pretty much everything and here we've got the stock market the last game in town is going to take that too that that is true this is this is the ultimate game and if this game goes away i don't know what there is you know what it could be then yeah i don't know it's like it almost like it could be things that hey, we could almost go back to like betting on weird arbitrary shit that like makes no difference or like like sports or something like that you know what i mean where it's sort of like it's kind of like this becomes the like value or like i don't know like it's <laughs> thing to think how how companies would operate if the stock market and the speculation on them were not part of the equation i have no idea obviously the other thing that i've come to realize is that as businesses use ai to develop product to iterate on their product build new models so ai is building ai is building businesses building ai i just think companies are going to be like meme coins yeah they'll be amazing for six months and then they'll be completely worthless like i used to use otter ai for Zoom calls, and it would do a transcript. It was pretty clunky, but it was a AI that would do a transcript and send us both a note to say, "Here's the summary of the conversation." Yeah, Zoom have just brought one out. It's perfect. Well, yeah. goodbye, Otter AI. You know, and it's like, and they're only like a year old. Yeah. So I just think there's some weird velocity that's going to happen too. That's going to be much more like crypto that we're all used to. Is things can be amazing for a short attention span, and then just never remember them ever again. A hundred percent. And that's where, again, I go back to this like meme thing is like, again, if, then you combine the meme of like the, the sort of like one of these companies kind of like taking hold. And like, I don't know, like that's where I could see something like crypto actually breaking everything. Because again, I could see something where there's like hyperinflation and Bitcoin just released goes to like, you know, truly a fucking insane escape velocity where everybody in the course of say a week or two weeks is sort of like okay fuck the ship is going down like do i fucking jump off this ship because like this dollar and all this other shit is becoming rapidly fucking worthless like suddenly a cheeseburger just went from being two dollars to Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, just and like this is rapidly becoming worthless because people truly do not have any fucking like uh, any confidence in the dollar. And again, that is we we all take for granted that there's confidence in these money systems. But again, if the meme is there's no confidence anymore, then in very quickly, and that meme could could fucking like spread very quickly where everybody loses confidence where it's just like okay yeah no what were we thinking this is like we literally kept joking about how they were printing money no they're printing money like what are we doing and everybody within the course of just like a, you know two weeks or something is like mm, this is the new system like i don't know like i could see that happening like I, a yeah. very very rapid switch to this new system which i don't even know what that would do like may or may not be good or like i i have no idea i've always thought that they these were parallel systems 
and this was billed specifically because this one was so fucked, and that over time people have been migrating. Now, could you get this rapid migration? You know, that's possible as well. So listen, final question for you. What's next for you or for people? Um, well, we've set up a number of horrific uh, fucking scenarios here, so I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, because the AI is taking your job. You're not wearing the Apple glasses. Everybody else is living in 3D world. You're miserable. And, um, and somebody else has won all the money. Other than that, what's left? I don't know. I guess it's just drawing a bunch of dicks. <laughs> <laughs> all this We're all just going to be fucking sitting around drawing dicks. I guess I'll still be good at that. I guess uh, somebody will still appreciate <laughs> that. Um, no, I think to me, you know, sort of just kind of very high level is, is continuing to sort of like, you know, make our with the everydays and, and sort of we got a bunch of these these kind of kinetic sculptures similar to human one that we're working on and then just really figuring out how to utilize the studio here in this space to, to yeah, bring it's an amazing studio you've done an amazing uh, thing um to bring people together and sort of in my opinion kind of i look at this space as as kind of something i see in museums in you know 10 20 years or something like that something where they have experiential immersive rooms um, and show a bunch of different um, digital content and are places where people gather and can see a wide variety and an actually diverse group of voices and ideas. I'm just, I'm laughing, I'm trying to take you seriously and then I'm remembering going into the bathroom where there's the voiceover of you talking about poo. Yeah, it's also something the museums will have. <laughs> Everybody walked into that bathroom, fell about laughing. A, there's an uncomfortable picture of, again, male genitalia. But then there's... So you you are creating a museum space, and it is epic. I mean, I, yeah, I actually love, like, all of the... Your history, that, that space with all of what makes you and your history. It's amazing. It's super cool. But there are male genitalia and weird sound bites in the bathrooms. That's all I'm saying. It may be the future. I, I get it. That is, it's a weird future. And I do think the future, that, that is one other thing, is I do really think the future is going to be bizarre. Because I think these things are going to continue to, technologies are going to continue to combine in ways that we do not expect. And it's like, oh. Okay, yeah, I guess if you combine that with that, then you know, I guess you could do that. And, like, I think we're at the very sort of, like, start of that as things, you know, kind of move faster and faster now. And I think future's going to be weird as fuck. It's going to be weird as Well, time to be alive. That's how I think of it. I'm like, we're so oh, privileged. Yeah. And we're yeah. privileged to be around this, this little corner of it as well because it feels like we're right at the epicenter of stuff. And it's, it's magic. And I just feel blessed that we're all part of this whole thing. And what oh. I love is everyone's got a grin on their faces. Even however shit it is, everyone's still got a grin on their faces because they're like, yeah, we're all in this together and it's kind of fun. And we're, this is a point in time. I agree. Very much agree. Mike, that was a lot of fun and a lot of interesting stuff. Super appreciate it. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to talk here. Super, super had a great time. And uh, yeah. Very much appreciate it. We'll get you back another time. Awesome. So that was hilarious, wide-reaching and fascinating conversation. I just love this culture of the internet being recorded in art. And, and the way that Mike understands how people change on the internet and become juvenile and he embraces that to create the kind of shock that it's meant for with that juvenile behavior and the drama of the internet that plays out every day. He's like a central piece. And I, I mentioned it to him, and I, it's, it's, it's really something. It's like when something dramatic happens in crypto or the world at large, Twitter or X is all ablaze. It's everywhere. People are talking, posting, arguing, fighting, screaming, shouting, and memes are popping up. 
and it's it's like this really buzzy town hall or village square and people kind of appears like the village idiot at the end of the day and goes here was your day for you and i see that post and it's always amazing i'm still scarred by some of them the uh, sam bankman freed and the caroline ellison one where he's in prison i won't describe the details or the sam bankman freed um party scene with all of the sam bankman freeds that these things are stuck in my mind but at the time like it was a really tense moment and at the end of the day, Beeple's kind of summary of the day pops as a piece of art. It's it's genius. And I was lucky enough to be in his studio recently. And th- because there was a lot of um, very well-known people there, um, he put this uh, every day together. And then as soon as he's together, he presses the red button on his desk and they airdrop from the ceiling as prints. In fact, I'm trying to see. I've, I think I've got one next to me here in the desk. So these were done at Beeple's place. And these are the iterations. <laughs> I mean, like, typical Beeple. So these are the iterations before the final the final thing came through, which is then printed and put on, onto X uh, and forms part of the, of the everydays. So it's, it's a magic thing. And I've really got into NFTs over time as I've started to think of it as the peak of this whole crypto thing, the madness that the revolution, everything. I'm starting to think, okay, this collective part, the collecting part of culture and of the moment in time encapsulated in an NFT might well be incredibly valuable. A, it's a nice reminder of what's happening. You can see by NFTs behind me there, or some of them. But it's, it's really something I think is going to be important in time because we are living through the exponential age and this is the moment in time where it all really kicked off from about 2020 onwards. So I've become much bigger into NFTs and I think over time I'll probably end up just in that world as opposed to in the crypto world overall. That's not for now. That's a story for another day when I've got to the point that I want to get to in this whole crypto journey. But I, I'm really, really interested and Mike's helped me with that journey as well. Um, at Real Vision, we're obviously minting our season three of the collective, so don't forget to mint. If you're watching this after the mint's gone through, the collective is a nice way of us bringing together the collective approach of what is so great about this space. Different art, different people, different countries, getting them together, getting them to talk to each other, share ideas, and also comp- bring in some of that gaming element that we kind of find fun on the internet, the sort of thing that brings us together as people. So there's a lot there, so uh, don't forget to mint. All right, see you around next time. Join over 5,000 attendees for the largest AI event in Asia at Super AI Singapore, June 5th and 6th, 2024. Raul Powell, Benedict Evans, Balaji Srinivasan, Edward Snowden, and over 150 others will join the industry's most influential to explore and unveil the next wave of transformative AI technologies. Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a week from June 3rd through June 9th with over 150 side events that will make for unparalleled networking opportunities. Visit www.realvision.com forward slash super AI for 20% off tickets with the code realvision or click below. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.